everyone, and welcome to episode 152 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Sometimes you come across a book and you immediately know that it's going to make the top 10 of your favorite books of the year. And friends, I'm happy to share one of those books with you today. As you know, I'm always eager to learn more about the day-to-day of the medieval world, so anything that gets me closer to it and can answer my questions about people's lived experiences is something to get excited about. So this week, I'm very happy to be talking with Dr. Catherine French about the ins and outs of people's homes in late medieval London. Catherine is the J. Frederick Hoffman Professor of History and Associate Chair of History at the University of Michigan, and the author of several books, including People of the Parish, Good Women of the Parish, and Women and Gender in the Western Past, along with Alison Posca. Her new book is Household Goods and Good Households in Late Medieval London, which looks at material culture to tell us about how people lived and what they thought was important, both before and after the Black Death. Our conversation on what Londoners' homes were like, what they filled them with, and how we know is coming up right after this. Well, thank you for joining me, Catherine. It is so nice to meet you, and I absolutely adore the book. So thanks for coming on. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you for loving my book. It's great. This is exactly the kind of stuff that I'm really interested in. And this is the kind of book that I would have loved to have had like (laughs) when I started doing this. So I'm happy that it's out there for people to read. Okay, so let's just dive into it. Can you give us a little bit of a picture before we really get started of what London was like? Because we're really focused on London in this book. What London was like pre-plague and post-plague, like demographically, what are we looking at? So we are looking pre-plague at a very crowded, crowded city. People living multiple people to a room, people adding on, you know, very dubious additions so that they could have more room or they could rent out more space. People are eating, sleeping, and working all in the same space. Even for the very well-off, life is a bit more crowded. Obviously, it's always better to be rich. You get to live a different kind of life, but it still seems more crowded. They're hemmed in by the walls. The current thinking on the population is that it may have been 80 to 100,000 people. Now, that does not make London the biggest city in the Middle Ages at this point, far from it, but it is crowded and people don't have uh, multiples of things. You know, things are expensive. They're spending the larger percentage of their income on food and shelter, the two basic needs. So you don't have multiple sets of clothing, multiple sets of sheets. Your food is not as variable. So I think crowded, difficult, not as many nice things. Mm -hmm. Um, After the plague, it's going to take a while. But that first century after the plague, things really open up quite literally. The population may have been halved. We don't have particularly good evidence or information. Let me just say, we don't have really good demographic information. But, you know, half the population may have died within the space of a year, a year and a half. And I think that's hard to grasp what that's like. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the material environment does not disappear. So right now with the invasion of Ukraine, we really are getting a sense of what it's like to empty out a city very rapidly, but that's being accompanied by just horrific devastation. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen with the plague. The buildings still stand, the streets are still there. So in a year and a half, the population has maybe halved. So people are beginning to spread out. I actually imagine in those first few years, there's probably a lot of squatters who are just moving into other buildings or into the building next door. Now, that's not going to last because the the city law does not disappear. Mm -hmm. Many aldermen die, things like that. But law does not disappear. City government does not disappear. Neighbors who survive or heirs who come in to take over property that they have inherited are going to push back. So the squatting thing, don't think that this is going to run rampant for a really long period of time. But in fact, people are going to spread out. I think fairly quickly, people are going to not have to eat and work and sleep all in the same place. Mm -hmm. And so as wages go up, people are going to spend a smaller percentage of their income on food and shelter. And so they're going to be able to buy a second pair of sheets 
that cool pair of shoes, <laughs> another outfit. Oh, I love those spoons I saw in the marketplace. I don't really need a second spoon, but I'm going to get a second spoon. <laughs> so people are going to begin to buy nicer things. They're going to begin to buy things to store those things in. Because if you buy yourself a nice new dress, you don't want it lying in the frying pan or next to a greasy <laughs> frying pan. So you're going to need storage space. You're going to need chests. If you have the room, you might have two chests you know, one for one set of things and one for another set of things. So things are going to become a little bit more colorful, a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more spread out. Now, at the same time, London is going to continually have immigration. So London's population is probably not going to stay halved the way it might in other parts of the countryside. But we don't think the population really gets to pre-plague levels until pretty much in the, the 16th century. Yeah, right. So there is a, a whole shift. And I think that's important that you mentioned that you really need to take a minute and picture what this is like every second or third person disappeared, because that right. makes a huge difference. And we're not really going to be talking too much about the trauma of that. But I mean, right. to picture that in space is really important. So well, and I think, I think it's important not to forget about the trauma, even though that is really hard to see. Yeah. But I think that it's important to read that in to thinking about materially how life changed after the plague. And I think we could actually say that the increase in, increase in consumption is perhaps a way of dealing with that trauma. Yeah. You know, yes, I've lost my entire family, and now I'm going to try and come up with strategies to sort of keep going and maybe a comfortable space or a second set of sheets, more blankets on my bed, nicer bedding, maybe that's all part of dealing with the trauma. I don't want to do modern psychology yeah. because yeah. I think there, that's just too complicated. There's too many pitfalls to doing that. But I think it's it's important to keep in mind the trauma that that is hovering out there. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with you there. Okay, so we're talking about how it's difficult to find out what the demographics are of London. You have to make a best guess. And the question I want to ask you before we get into the details, because I don't want to forget to ask you is, how do you find out what people have in their houses? Because in a city like London that's been built on top of itself for many centuries, you don't find a lot of archaeological stuff where it was. So how did you find out what people had in their houses? So I started with inventories. That's the source that most people have used. The survival of inventories is quite good for the early modern period. It's not very good for the medieval period, especially in England. So I started with probate inventories. Those are the sort of the most common. We have a lot of them for the Mediterranean. People have used them. So I thought, oh, I'll start with inventories. And the probate inventories for London are, they start late. I think the earliest one might be about 1460. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, a century after the plague. So I then was pointed to another kind of inventory, debt inventories. These are called extents for debts. Actually, Anne DeWitt mentioned to me, oh, you should look at Martha Carlin's work on extent for debts. She's got a bunch of inventories. And sure enough, Martha Carlin had actually cataloged the extent for debts for London and Suffolk. So I was able to go through and just pull out those extents for debts that had inventories that still survived. So I went and looked at the extent for debt. There are gaps. So I don't have a consistently even collection of inventories from the plague up to, I stopped in about 1540. But I was able to get a nice sort of spread of inventories after the plague I had been working on wills. I had worked on wills with my earlier work on parishes. So I knew that wills had material culture in them. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll just supplement them with wills. And then that actually became quite the sort of rabbit hole of research. I think I made every single possible mistake you could make <laughs> in building a database. I thought, well, I'll just start and I'll look at one, you know, I'll look at one register of wills. And they matched up with the probate inventories. And then, you know, the project just got bigger and bigger. And I had to figure out a sampling technique. And then I, you know, sampled badly and I had to redo it. And I didn't want to have to throw away very much research. So I had, well, I did this one register, register seven. So like, how can I do a sample that allows me to use all of register seven? And, <laughs> and so I have all these sort of databases that didn't quite work out. And then I had my database which required basically reading 3,000 wills. 
mm-hmm. about half of which had material culture. And so I had this relational database where I kept track of all the wills in my sample. And I was doing five years at 20 year increments. And I went back to a, you know the beginning and then went forward. So I built this database. Actually, I started in the middle and then I kind of went in both directions <laughs> after and then before. And so about 50% of these wills in primarily two courts, two London courts had material culture. And then I tracked the material culture that was in these wills. And then I took it to our stats people here at the University of Michigan, because I wanted to know if my statistical sampling was going to be significant. And I was finding very cool things with just basic statistics, but I felt like I needed to know just how robust were my statistics. And they ended up with this lovely man, but he usually worked with giant samples for the med school. And he's like, well, this sampling just won't work. You know, you've got it tagged to change over time and we can't possibly have that. And, you know, you have to throw out your entire sample. You have to start all over again. And I was like practically in tears, like, no, I've worked on this for two years. No, don't tell me this. And I sort of went away and had a think. And I came back and I was like, wait, no, of course I want change over time. I'm a historian. Like, (laughs) change over time is supposed to be there. What are you talking about? And he was like, oh, well, you know, I never, I never thought about that. So, you know, we both sort of recalibrated. My sampling was fine. He did some fancy statistical magic, came up with some formulas. He's like, yes, you have very robust data. It's just fine. (laughs) Um, And I went away a very happy medievalist. (laughs) That's amazing. Like, I don't think when people go into medieval studies, they necessarily think you're going to be spending all this time with spreadsheets, but often you do. (laughs) Oh, I love a good spreadsheet. It's, it sort of organizes the world for me. It's just a, an advanced way of making lists and crossing things off. You know, I make lists to organize like a busy week. We have cal- Google calendars or, or Outlook calendars now to organize our busy weeks. So really a spreadsheet is, is just a, a, a version of that. <laughs> it's your own personal inventory. Inventorying right. inventories. <laughs> Right. All right. Okay. So one of the major themes that you have in the book is that we are told that medieval artisans and merchants are often just imitating their betters and they're just trying to be like the aristocracy. And your sense of it is that they are adapting these practices. They're not imitating. So can you tell us how that works when when you finally have the resources to buy the stuff that the rich have? How is it working for medieval merchants and artisans? This is something I worked my way through in the project. The emulation thesis is is really powerful. And it's not as if I think that merchants and artisans aren't looking at the rich going, oh, I would like to have a, you know, a nice cloak like that, or, oh, I'd like to have, you know, fur around my hood to keep me warm. So at one level, imitation is there. You get ideas by looking at you know what other people have. I mean, I go around my, my neighborhood and I look at all kinds of houses and go, oh, I could do that for my house, or mm-hmm. uh, ooh, no, I could never do that for my house. <laughs> but the thing is, I bring it back into my world and I use it differently. And that's really the point I'm trying to make about merchants and artists is, is that when they they have more betting, which of course the, the, the rich, the nobles also have more betting. But they're they're using it and doing it within a completely different context. You know, they live in their houses differently. Their resources come from different places. They're urban. They have they have ties to the countryside, of course, but their income is derived from manufacturing, from trade, from an urban context. And so to say that this is strictly emulation really misses the point, I think, in understanding about an urban mercantile artisan life. Yes, of course, the very richest have country estates. They want to marry their daughters into the the gentry at the very least. But most of them keep a foothold in the city. And so that means, in fact, that they're still doing it differently. Mm -hmm. And I have a section in my book where I looked at the country estates of some very rich merchants and their London houses and looked at their living in their London and their country houses really very differently. Their country houses, they're actually living a more stripped down life. Their kitchens are smaller. They are less provisioned than their London houses. And so that's really what I was trying to get at is to sort of think about the ways in which you know, this material culture is being adapted to suit a mercantile life rather than being strictly 
imitative of what you see the, the rich doing. And another thing I really want to point out is that some of this is about being human. You want to be warm and comfortable. So why should that only be something that the rich get to do? Mm-hmm. So is that imitative that you want to be warm and comfortable? I think that's human. If imitating the rich is also wanting your children to survive. And so you're going to do the things that the rich do, or you're going to try and get the medical accoutrements or the apotropaic devices that the rich have to have your children survive. I would also contend that that is human. And I I take a, a pretty dim view that the idea that poor people want medical care is imitative. You know, that's just elitist bullshit. (laughs) So I think some of this is about being human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things I noticed running through this is that people from the Middle Ages are always put down for being dirty and stuff. But the second that they have money, they put it into cleanliness. They're putting it into more sheets. They're putting it into ewers and basins and towels that they leave at the door so that you can wash when you come in. Is that something you notice too? Yes, exactly. Yes. Medieval people do not have the, the standard of cleanliness that we think of today, but we also have knowledge about bacteria and viruses, air pollution. We know, you know, in a scientific way what it does to you, but no, absolutely. People want to be clean. And so, yes, they are trying very hard to be clean. I do not actually tag that to the plague. I don't think there's a tight connection between plague and cleanliness. There is a connection about miasma and people thought that the plague was spread by miasma and so they wanted cleanliness in that way. But that's a that's a disease thing, not necessarily a plague thing. And so I suspect that if they had had the money, they would have wanted basins and ewers pre-plague as well. Yes, absolutely. I agree. And I think that sheets are a good example, which we've brought up a couple of times because no one is going to see your sheets, but you are going to know that they are cleaner. They've been laundered and they've been put back on the bed. And that's a really right. important place where you can see that intersection between I have more money, therefore I'm going to be more comfortable and cleaner. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and if we look at the the Menanger's manual for his wife, I understand this is not English. This is this is French, but he gives instructions for how to clean the fleas out of the bed. Mm-hmm. You know, those are annoying. They're they're itchy. You know, so so yeah, people want to be comfortable, and part of being comfortable is cleanliness to a certain degree. I know we can get used to being dirty. You don't take a shower every day like Americans do. You can get used to not taking a shower every day. But at a certain level, you want to be clean. It's itchy to be dirty. (laughs) That's it. Exactly. Okay. So let's talk about some of the things that people add to their houses. So you have more money. You're going to add more things to your houses. And one of the things that I think is important that is different from us today is that we tend to have more cash money. If we have more money, we keep it in the bank, but they kept it in possession. So what kind of stuff will you add to your house as soon as you get some more money? So you're going to add more bedding. You're going to add more plate. Both of those things will hold value because if your household runs into financial difficulties, you can sell your plate, you can sell your cloth. Cloth is very high value. And so bedding is a lot of cloth. And so you can sell that and people might use it as bedding, but they might also cut it up and use it for clothing. So So you're going to buy clothing, you're going to buy plate. Eventually, you're going to buy wall hangings because they look nice, but they will also promote an an image to visitors that will also have value in doing business. You know, I want to do business with this household because I can see, you know, they're a very pious household. You know, they're, they're committed to the works of mercy. They love the virgin. So those are the kinds of things that you're going to buy. Hanging cloths, if they're just painted canvas, those are going to have less value for resale. Tapestries, of course, are going to have a lot of resale value. But cloth items and plate items are going to be the big things that you're going to buy. And then you're going to have a chest so you can put those things in them to safeguard them. (laughs) Yes, I love chests. I love that whole idea of them and picturing them. And I think that maybe people picture them as being like this plain wood, but they're often painted and decorated. They're beautiful objects. Yes, they are. And once the technology is available for making wainscoting, chests become wainscoted, so they're decorative. You know, it's fair to say that maybe they're not as robust as we might want them for preventing burglars from taking them. 
But there's a lot of sort of decoration around security theater to either fool people into thinking that they're safe or because that becomes an aesthetic that you like, metal bits on your chest to make it look more robust. But they are, in fact, an object that people decorate in a variety of ways. There's a lot of them in houses, so you might as well make them pretty or aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. One of the shifts that you noticed, it's related to chess, but also just the use of rooms, is that over the course of time, people are having a less transient lifestyle and they also are using rooms for just one designated purpose. And you've noticed that the furniture is not transformational anymore. It's very sturdy. It's meant to stay in one spot. So how did this happen? What, why did this happen? Well, some of it is related to technology, that wood mills become more common, so you can make boards easier. So the price of, of boards for making wainscoting, making tabletops, all of those kinds of things, becomes cheaper. And there's some suggestion that one of the reasons why wood lumber mills become more common is that you had all of these water mills and fulling mills, but with the decline in population, they needed to be repurposed. So that's part of it. Also, if you're not going to be schlepping about the country as much, then your furniture can be more decorative and it becomes a way of showing off a different kind of skill. Um, you know, really by the 16th century, woodworking skills, joineries, your hall with the fancy staircase, you know, think about that kind of thing, carved wainscoting. We live in a world that tends to think dark paneling is oppressive and we don't like it. I would tend to disagree with that aesthetic, but nonetheless, um, I live in a house where they painted all my woodwork at some point in the 70s, which uh, is unbearably sad. Mm. But nonetheless, the carving that goes into wood making, woodworking becomes another status item. Mm. And so that is actually kind of competing with cloth as a status item. So do you want to have a, a table with carved legs that you're going to cover up with a fancy tablecloth? Well, you know you can afford to have this fancy table, even if it's not going to have a tablecloth on it. Or you're going to leave the table there. People are going to see it when they come into the room. The tablecloth will go on when you dine, but it'll come off and then it'll be, you know, something nice to look at. And you don't need to take the table and put it away because you now have a room to receive guests. You have a room to eat in. You can have a table in your bedroom to put your things on, your books, your shoes, your, your knife, your girdle, your eyeglasses, your St. John's head. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so that's bringing us to the idea of dividing rooms. And I think that perhaps it's something that, again, people need to kind of put into their minds. Even urban houses before the plague had open halls as part of their design scheme. And one of the things that you're mentioning is that people started to add rooms and subdivide and, and start to just give rooms a designated purpose instead of reusing the room for everything. What kind of rooms do you see people adding? So what room would you see people adding kind of first or what was an important room to add to your house? What do you see happening? I think one of the first things I see is people trying to sleep away from the busyness of the household. Obviously not everybody gets to sleep away from the business, busyness of the household. The householder is going to get to sleep away first. In very well-appointed merchant houses, servants are also going to get their own bedrooms, not going to be necessarily sleeping in the halls. But I think the first thing is to sleep away from your work if possible. And then you're going to begin to see rooms that allow you to sort of retreat from the busyness of the household either to do your accounts, to conduct business deals. This idea of being able to do work away from the supervision of everybody, some of this might be about keeping secrets. I don't want to dwell too much on that modern notion of privacy. Medieval houses are easy to hear things through the doors, through the walls. So it's not as if it's super secure. But there's this idea of being away from the oversight of everybody. So eventually, these are rooms that are going to be called parlors, where the householder and his family might retreat away from the servants or away from the apprentices. They might dine as a family, or you might dine with your sort of social intimates. 
Or you might retreat after the main meal where everybody is there and the householder is doing his thing to show that he's in charge and he knows what's going on in his household. But then he's going to retreat, you know, afterwards to pray, to reconsider, things like that. Yeah. The section about parlors is one of my favorites in the whole book because it's so interesting to see this room and how it's transforming and what it's being used for. And you're finding stuff in parlors that it has to do with business often, but also has to do with entertainment. So you have games and musical instruments. Like this is really fascinating to me. <laughs> right. And I think there was even one parlor that had a bird cage. Yeah. You know, so like the, I don't know, the nightingales or whatever that the bird was, is also part of the entertainment and the relaxing kind of atmosphere that people are, are aiming for. Yeah, one of my favorite sections is where you compare the parlors of two men. One's a draper, one's a goldsmith. You'll remember this part. I yeah. can see you nodding. And you have one who is a widower. So he's using his parlor for different things. And then you have one who is unhappily married and he's using his parlor for different things. So <laughs> that was great. Yeah, and that was that was really fun to do to be able to see, you know, these men are pretty much contemporaries. They're very wealthy. The goldsmith, in fact, is a mayor, and I'm Matthew. Matthew Phillips. Yes, Matthew Phillips. Yeah, so they're contemporaries, but their houses are really arranged rather differently. And it's not just because Phillips is a goldsmith and, and Thomas Sal is a draper. Thomas Sal's income largely, I think, comes from importing gems. So he's not really doing a lot of drapery work. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, yeah, so like the way your house is constructed is to suit your needs. And that's as much about your family relationships as your business opportunities. Yeah. And I mean, Matthew Phillips, as you say, he became mayor. And so I picture this parlor as being some place where you have cigars with the people who you, are, you need to hobnob with, right? Leave everyone else in the hall. We're going to have a private conversation about what you can do for me. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You know, I'm going to lean on you to do a few things because yes. And I mean, we get the impression that Matthew Phillips was not a particularly nice man. You know, he he is very, very aware of his status. So he has very fancy wall hangings in his parlor. They're, they're the, one of the most expensive items in his house. At some point, he is treated, he thinks, badly by, I think it's the Duke of Gloucester. So he just leaves and then throws his own rival banquet. So, you know, like he can upstage the Duke of Gloucester. And yeah, he's very unhappily married, but he lets you know he's unhappily married in his will. It's a really unusual amount of honesty or <laughs> nastiness. His wife is not going to get the uh, wall hangings. He says that particularly. And he says if she fusses about her inheritance, which he follows the letter of the law, she's not being disinherited. She gets a third like she's supposed to. But he says then I'm just cutting you out completely. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of a remarkable amount of detail you get about him. And in contrast to Thomas Sal, who seems to be everybody's friend, you know, he's got tons of people in his will, his grave in the churchyard. He wants it to be a place where people can sit down and have a conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love that. I love that. It was such a contrast between the two of them. And it was yeah. so it was so funny to see a few things that were surprising to me where I expect people in the Middle Ages, whether they're merchants, artisans or knights to have weapons, but they had a lot of weapons in their halls. Holy. <laughs> I know. And then when it becomes not quite the thing to display them in the hall, they still have them, but they're storing them in the servants quarters. Now, yeah. does that make sense? That just seems like a really bad idea that your your journeymen, your your servants, your male servants are going to have access to swords. Yeah. Yeah. Just and saying, not what I would do. <laughs> Big battle axes and stuff. Now we're talking about wills and the things that people are providing as they're dying. And the stuff that you see in women's wills is really interesting. And you kind of divide this out a little bit. One of my, my favorite kind of touching moments is one woman who's dying and says, okay, well, I don't have the best bedspread on my bed right now because I'm dying, <laughs> but I have some other good ones and I want to give those good ones to other people. And it, it's so human because of course you don't put your best bedspread on the bed when things are probably quite messy, but you right. see women who are giving stuff. One of the points that you make is giving stuff to younger people. And you're suggesting that it's possibly like a shower gift. Like I'll give you these things so you can set up your own household. I think that's really fascinating. Yeah, and, and what you also see is that women are doing this more than men. And some of that is about the law. Men are, are, especially if they are married, they really can't just 
get rid of all of their stuff the way they might hope to do because they're leaving behind a household and the law is really quite specific about how they can divide up their estates. But women, when they make wills, are widows. So they really are disbanding a household. And so you really do get to see their priorities. And even when I controlled for life cycles so that I looked at men who I knew they were widows or widowers, you could really see that they still had slightly different priorities than women. Even though they're both widows and widowers are breaking up a household, men still seem to be much more interested in sort of lineage and family. Now that might capture young people and give young people things, but they tend to be people who are obviously members of the family, whereas widows are also remembering their servants who are not obviously members of the family. They might be, they might be distant country cousins, but I also tried to keep track to the degree that I could, you know, what's the servant's relationship? It's a servant or, oh, this is also, it seems to be a cousin. And it's still that the women are still interested in sort of taking care of the young people. Yes. <laughs> I can hear your dog in the background. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, I don't know how to uh, control for this. She has decided to show me her squeaky toys. Sorry that's, about that. That's okay. People love that human element. And that's actually something I was about to get to as well, is you see so much care in these wills. There's one woman, a different one, who said, okay, I'm leaving a set of bedding for each of my sons. And you'll find them here in the house and they're all labeled with their names. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness, like the care this woman has put into this bequest that she's making is is amazing. And one of the notes that you also say is that women more often say you'll find it here in the house. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, there's pride in the house. And yes, I know pride is a sin and all of that. And, and some of these women probably were very competitive with each other or with their neighbors about who kept a nicer house. But at the same time, this is also a, a way of showing the success of the family and their success at, as housewives at having managed all of this, having kept it for the next generation and the way it, it displays who they are. That's um, the Westminster widow. And she's very proud of her sets. She has all these sets. So she has sets of spoons and sets of dishes <laughs> and sets of, of girdles, sets of mazers, these, these very fancy wooden drinking bowls. And so that's clearly her thing. You know, she went and got a set of all 12 apostle spoons. She probably <laughs> ordered before midnight tonight so she could get the discount. So yeah, you get this, this sense that this is like who they are. And remember, wills are one of the few sources that we have a, a, for women's writing. Ordinary women are writing wills. Yes, they are dictating them to a scribe or to their parish priest, but Marjorie Kemp did the same thing and nobody's like saying she didn't write her book. So this is <laughs> women's writing. And yes, it's constrained by all kinds of legal and, and social and religious conventions, but this is a way of getting women's personality and concerns and priorities out there. And so I think taking these wills seriously for what they can tell us about the world that women are living in is, is really worthwhile. Yeah, they're really revealing because they're not so concerned with the laws that they forget to think about the providence sure. of the object, right? So like, this is the girdle that we got on this anniversary, or like, this yeah. is the thing that we bought together or that was given from this person. And there's this kind of idea, it seems, of making sure that the stories are told with the objects. And that's something you've known you've noticed as well is that there's more memorializing of people through objects as time goes on. So how did this evolve, do you think? Well, I think that this is part of learning to live with more stuff. On the one hand, you know, you have more money in your pocket and now you're going to buy more sheets and you're going to buy a plate because it's a good investment and things are tough and you don't know what, how the world is going to shape out. So I've got some extra money. Maybe I'm going to try and put some stuff aside to help me if things, you know, go south financially. But eventually, as you accumulate more stuff and you use them and they become associated with people, you know, you are building up memories. They are, I think, a way of reaching into the past to remember the people who have come before you. And in fact, this may be part of the way of grappling with trauma is that you don't want to forget everybody who has died. And, and OK, yes, you know, my widows who are dying in the later 15th century are not necessarily talking about items that family members purchase right after the plague. The plague is now 100 years in the past, 
But nonetheless, learning to live with more goods is learning to think about their variety of uses, storing fiduciary values, certainly usefulness. It's nice to have a nice bowl that doesn't leak or isn't broken that I can carry water or stew or whatever around the house. But, you know, it's even nicer if it's pretty or if somebody noticed I had a cracked bowl and then they gave me a nice one. And then that was a person who I cared about. Now I'm thinking about that person who gave me that or I had such a funny exchange in the marketplace when I bought it or there was that creepy man and somebody saved me from <laughs> a creepy man. And so, you know, you have experiences around material goods. And I think people are going to realize that actually quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so learning to live with more goods is learning the variety of values you can attach to them, monetary, emotional, practical. Yeah. And it's interesting to see how that plays out. One of the highlights for me in the book is seeing you think through another mother, and I don't think it's the same as the Westminster widow, who's talking about giving things to each of her sons. And one of the things is like a cup with St. George on it, I think is a mazer with St. George on it. And she doesn't give it to her son named George, but she right. gives it to her son named Henry in memory of their father who's named George. And I think right. thinking that it through. Is, it is in fact the same. It is the Westminster will. It that's is, a, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's just a terrific will. I use that will actually when I teach because it's so detailed. I mean, I've transcribed it and put it in modern, lang modern English. But what's also interesting about that one is that her son George is clearly a problem. <laughs> yeah. Because she says, you know, and if George fusses about his inheritance, he gets cut off. Yeah. And she wants her older son to try and convince George to be a better person and whatever. So yes, again, there's memorialization, but there's also like she values this mazer in a number of ways. And yeah, she doesn't want George selling it at the gaming table. Right, right. Absolutely. You have to consider these things. I don't think we really mentioned what a mazer is, but this is something that I think we sort of mentioned, but not really detailed. Actually, Kathleen Kennedy was my first episode and we were talking about coconut cups. And right, mazers yes. are like this, right? They're wooden bowls, they're fancy, and they're meant to share drink. But you talk a little bit about how a mazer actually constructs the manners around it. So can you tell us a little bit about mazers before we go? Because I think this is interesting. <laughs> sure. So mazers are made out of maple burls and burls are a little like pearls and that they are the, the wood that grows over a bunch of, of buds or twigs or a wound. They have beautiful, beautiful grain. And so they're sought after because of the beauty of the grain. But because they are, they have such complicated grain, they're also really hard to work with. Mm -hmm. Maple is a very hard wood to work with anyway, and then not having a regular grain just makes it even harder. So making a mazer out of this maple burl is a tough process, quite literally, but then beautiful when it's done. And you end up with a, a wooden drinking bowl with a metal band at the top, which not only adds height to the bowl, but it also helps preserve the edge from liquids. There's a, a boss in the bottom which covers up the lathe hole, but that also becomes a, a place to put decoration. It might be a saint. <laughs> Sorry about the puppy. She was sound <laughs> downstairs and now she wants to be a part of things. It's okay. <laughs> so the boss at the bottom becomes a place to put maybe a religious image. Some of it's enameled, so it'd be colorful. And then often there'll be a foot at the bottom again to raise the height. And all of this sort of adds to the visual display. But some mazers can be quite big, and so you need to hold with two hands. The feet aren't really making it a goblet, so there's not a lot to grab. They don't have handles or ears, as they're sometimes referred to in, in inventories, mm -hmm. uh, my cup with the ears. But mazers don't have ears, and so you have to hold a bowl, and then you have to drink out of it. And they can be quite shallow, and so if you drink too fast, you're going to spill wine down your front. That's not classy. So the using of drinking out of a bowl, for people who drink their coffee French style, their morning coffee out of a bowl, they might be familiar with this. But, you know, there are small ones which are easier to hold. You know, maybe you can hold it in one hand, but it's still much harder than a tankard of ale mm -hmm. uh, or a tankard for ale. And so you can really see that the circumstances of use are dictated by the shape. And, you know, whether there's a handle of, do you have to use two hands? What happens if you're going to keep drinking after you're drunk? Well, you 
can hold on to a mug much easier than a large mazer that you're going to also then have to give to somebody sitting next to you to also take a drink out of. So all of the things around the shape of a mazer are trying to create behaviors that are going to be appropriate to the occasion. And I read the behaviors as being kind of restrained, kind of dignified. This is not a place to lose a lot of control. This is performing good behavior respectability. Yeah. And so this is why they're so valuable. They give you respectability, not only through the object itself, but the way that you use it is going right. to be a way that shows everyone that you have class, no matter where you came right. from. <laughs> right. And sometimes, you know, you'll pair the, the image at the bottom with the person you're giving it to. I give the one with the St. Margaret in the bottom to my daughter, Margaret. You know, so there's a way that people are really kind of identifying with mazers. One woman leaves the mazer that she uses every day. And it's sort of like the coffee cup, you know, like I have a coffee cup that I really like to use every day. It holds the right amount of coffee. It has the right kind of image. And so, you know, I think these mazers are a little like coffee cups. For, for us. <laughs> and I think that one, I might be misremembering, but I think that one, the everyday cup, she gives to a servant or something. And that gives you that impression of like, maybe they had these interactions over the everyday use of the mazer. And like, I just love that kind of echo that you find in material objects. Right. Well, and it's just something about the relationship between a, the servant and their employer. You know, we know a lot more about exploitative, you know, vicious, difficult relationships. Hierarchies can lend themselves to a lot of bullying and, you know, behavior that's really pretty awful. But at the same time, some of these servants are relatives or people that you become fond of. And so Miss Marple in the Murder Mysteries was always training some village girl to be a servant so she would have a better life, you know, if she learned how to be a good servant. So there is a quality of that. And in some of these relationships, you see that there was some affection. And again, I don't want to romanticize this too much, but it's not all abuse and horror. Yeah, it's so complicated. And it's a great book in that you get at all of these complications and you look at possibilities for these things. What could they possibly mean? Thinking it through in a way that's transparent and really shows what these objects were and how they were meaningful to people. So I just adore this book and I'm so glad you came on the podcast. So thank you so much, Catherine. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. To find out more about Catherine's work, you can follow her on Twitter at kitfrench1348 or visit her faculty page at lsa.umich.edu slash history slash people slash faculty slash French K. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on this week, Peter? Hey, hey. This week we've been uh, talking about Rodrigo Diaz, otherwise known as El Cid. Uh, oh, you love El Cid. I do. I do. He was like the very first paper that I got published was in a little tiny journal. It was about who is El Cid, who is Rodrigo Diaz. I'm very proud of that. There you go. And it's this article that's being posted. <laughs> <laughs> That's a germination of it. So we're looking at that him, that the idea of like, who is Rodrigo Diaz, who is El Cid, and also the story of him in Valencia, right? The sieges is kind of a key exploit. So we've got that. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of fun stuff. Fun mm -hmm. stuff if you're El Cid, I guess. <laughs> well, hopefully it's fun stuff for readers too. <laughs> yeah. So we've got that. Plus, Catherine Walton is looking at the road to the Reformation. It didn't just happen all at once, right? Well, you know, there's... <laughs> There's a series of things that led up to Luther. You mean he wasn't just the only person who thought that maybe the Catholic <laughs> Church should change its ways? Hey, <laughs> one day decided, yeah, I'd make some changes. <laughs> Gotta make some changes. Okay, cool. Yeah, we've got that, plus continuing the series on Harold Hardrada, and uh, who knows what else is coming up. It's always a surprise for you <laughs> and for us. <laughs> it, yes, for me. Drops in my, my email box. Oh, surprise article. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Peter. Thanks. If you've been tuning in the last couple of weeks, you know that I'm soon going to be wrapping up the Medieval Masterclass for Creators. Although the Medieval Masterclass has helped dozens of people with their fictional creations over the last two years, it's time for me to build some new content, which means a glorious retirement for this Medieval Masterclass. 
Luckily, if you always wanted to get in on that action and never got around to it, even if you're not a fiction writer and just want more medieval in your life, I'm offering the masterclass one last time starting May 13th. So this is your last chance to get medieval with the help of my awesome master instructors from blacksmithing to textile work, combat to cooking. These are the people that I go to with questions and they are awesome. Not only do you get to experience their wisdom, you also get their recommended reading lists, a curated bibliography, and a free book. And finally, you get access one last time to my brain to ask your thorny questions about how to make your fiction better. This six-week online class with all of its amazing value and goodies is available one last time just for you. So please take me up on it. You can find all the information at MedievalMasterclass.com. Thank you, as always, to Medievalist.net's patrons on Patreon.com for all your support. Patrons can access all sorts of great stuff, like subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine, a book club, and exclusive maps by Tina Ross. Patronage directly funds this podcast, as well as Medievalist.net's other work, so thank you. To find out how you can help, please visit Patreon.com slash Medievalists. For everything from houses to mouses, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a spectacular day. Music